Hello and welcome. My name is Christina Richmond and I am a certif certified homeopath. Um, I'm also in marketing and I have a background in French literature which may not seem relevant, but I think what it tells us is that one could say I'm an interested and curious person, which makes us good homeopaths when we have broad interests. I'm also a graduate of the Homeopathy School International. I have gone all the way through all of their programs, including the advanced clinical program, and have found the support and the structure of the school very useful to me in my careers, both of my careers, actually, marketing and homeopathy. So before we start today, we are going to talk about starting a homeopathic practice. But before we start that, I just want to go over some housekeeping notes. You should have a control panel on your screen that allows you to ask questions. It's a little plus or minus sign and then the word questions. And you can type your questions in there. I'll be monitoring that and probably will answer questions towards the end of our talk. But please go ahead at any time and put your questions in. Your phones are muted. This is being recorded and it will be available on the website after the event has finished probably in a week or so. So let's get started and let's talk about what it means to be a homeopath just starting out. So we've talked a little bit about who I am. And the reason why I wanted to tell you who I am is because I think everything about ourselves shapes our practice. And so the next thing that I want to talk about is I want to talk about our identity. So who are you? Who are you in your day-to-day -day walk of life? I don't mean who are you in terms of my telling you, I'm a marketer, I'm a homeopath, um, I've got a French lit background. More about who are you broadly? Who are you as a person and how do you want to be known? And that's important to, to think about. It may sound trite, but it's actually really important when you're setting up a business. So I have a little exercise. You can follow along, you can do this later, and it's pretty short. But the first thing that I'd like you to do, and I'm just looking at some notes so you'll see me look away a little bit. The first thing that I'd like you to do is think of three things that you love. Things, not beings, but things. So I can give you an example from my life. The first three things that come up for me are lakes, trees, and I love that light in fall that comes sideways and cuts across a field or cuts through the trees and gives you this golden quality. So think now about three things that you love. And just, you know, you don't have to write them down, you don't have to run around for a piece of paper, but just think about those for a second. And next, think about beings that you love. It could be your family, that certainly comes up for me. It could be your animals, or maybe you love horses, or the sound of coyotes, so that makes you love coyotes. I don't know. I also love, beside my family and my kitties and my doggy, I also love water bugs, little skitter bugs that dance on top of the water. So these are three beings for me that I love. So just think for a second about that. And then next, think about what describes you. I would say I'm curious. I, I like to say I'm terminally curious because it'll, like the, the curiosity of the cat, it might be the death of me at some point. I'm really curious. So think about that for yourself. What describes you? Passionate? Eager? Maybe you're more pragmatic. And then next, think about something that challenges you. For me, it's that I try to do too much. I'm very curious, so I'm always loading my days, loading my time, and I do too much. It's my Husband's biggest complaint is, you do too much. So what's a challenge for you? 
Do you have difficulty getting going? Are you shy? Are you an extrovert or an introvert? So think about some of those things. And then think about what attribute you would like to portray, sort of an essential, essential attribute you would like to portray as a homeopath. For me, it's authenticity. I want to portray that I am authentically present with my clients, that I am who I say I am, that I look like what you see on the picture. My hair is a little different, but that that's who I am. So authenticity is important for me. And then lastly, and you know, again, this I, I think this is a bigger exercise you can do on your own, but ask yourself what success means to you. It might mean that you want to be well known. It might mean that you want to make a lot of money. It might mean that you'll feel successful if you're intellectually stimulated and challenged. It might mean that you want to help people. And all of those, any of those, are good answers. So just a few quick exercises just in the few minutes of this talk to help you look at your own identity. Because it's important to know who you are when you're starting out in this business. So you can see here in my slide that I have my Richmond Homeopathy logo on it. And then the picture below goes with the colors of that logo. And let me tell you how I came to this. And this is this is where we start in building a practice. We start with first asking, how do we want to present ourselves? Both in terms of a logo, in terms of our marketing collateral, in terms of how we talk to people, how we introduce ourselves, how we might do a little elevator pitch that says in two sentences what we do for a living. So this came about this logo came about for me because a dear friend of mine is a graphic designer and she did this little exercise with me that we just talked about. And I said, you know, I love trees. I love trees. And I told her this story about the ginkgo biloba tree in my front yard when I was growing up and how much my mother loved that tree and how it was such a different tree in suburban America than most of the trees I saw in my neighborhood. And how I loved how the leaves would kind of flicker and glimmer with the light, especially in the fall as the fall light cut across and did that slanty sort of luminescence across my lawn. I loved that ginkgo tree. And you know, I just thought this was a casual conversation, but my friend dear friend, graphic designer friend, found this image of the ginkgo leaves that is on my logo and it spoke to me immediately. And I thought how thoughtful and how caring that she came up with that. So then from that she played with the colors and the naturalness of the green and then a little bit of that light, that fall light that comes in in that kind of orange of my logo. And then a dear friend of mine who's a photographer, and you know, why not use your friends if you can, right? You don't have to pay for everything, or if you do, you pay your friends if you can to help you with pictures and logos and graphic design and marketing items that you need. So another dear friend took this picture of me, and she liked to say that she is an authentic photographer. She likes capturing people and their essence. So we went out on the hills, the foothills of Boulder where I live, and it was a fall day as you can see from the colors of the leaves. And she took a bunch of pictures and this picture really captures me, I think. Maybe my friends think it does or it doesn't, I don't know. But for me it spoke to me. So that's an important place to start is figure out what matters to you in your identity and then portray it. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money. Find a way to represent the things you love, the person you are, even your challenges in your identity. So we're going to now get into some meat of the talk and not just talk about overall identity. We're going to talk about your office 
and what that might look like to you. It has to fit your identity. So you might want to have an office like what is portrayed here in this picture. You might want to have staff behind a counter where people walk up and talk to someone who's friendly and greets them. You might not. You might just want a small room with a couch, a nice view, you know, something cozy. Decide for yourself what kind of office you would like. Now, for me, I, I built my practice in a chiropractor's office. It was a natural adjacency. It was supportive. I had staff. I had people greeting my clients as they came in. I had medical files that I filed things in and there were nice labels on them. I liked that structure. Other people I know have offices where you walk in, you sit down in a waiting area, there's nice music playing and maybe a little fountain, and then the homeopath comes out and greets them. So whatever office you decide is right for you, that's, it's, it's all a good answer. You could even have an office virtually. I have done many cases over the web and on the phone, and that works really well too. So you can see right now I'm in my home. You can see that there's a plant behind me and there's some of my china in my hutch. And it, you want to pick a spot where there's good light. You want to pick a spot where there's not too much noise and you won't be interrupted. And you want to pick a spot where you feel comfortable and you feel like you're representing yourself. So all these offices are possible ways of showing the world who you are as a homeopath and greeting your clients. Now the next thing you have to think about is what are your office hours? Now that sounds like a silly thing to talk about, but is it 9 to 5? Are you only available to your clients 9 to 5? Or are you a 24 by 7, 365 day a week homeopath? And you can get into a little hot water there. And I'll tell you that in my practice, I <laughs> I have been the 7x24x365 by by homeopath because I really, really wanted to be available. I feel like there are homeopaths on the planet who are not available enough. There are others who are very available. It's all a matter of what kind of boundaries you want to set up in your life. Maybe you have a busy home life, a busy family, and maybe you can only be available from 9 to 5, and that's fine. Maybe you want to set some Saturday hours. Maybe you want to be available all the time, but really think through what that means. Now, when someone's sick and they're in an acute situation, they really like to be able to connect with someone. And on the one hand, it's great to be available and to offer your clients that. On the other hand, it can burn you out pretty quickly. So finding that delicate balance of normally I'm available from X to Y time, but in the middle of a sickness, I will try to make myself more available to you during these hours. So just a suggestion, think about your hours and think about how it will blend with your life. Think about how you might stretch it when you need to and also constrain it when you need to. Also, let me talk a little bit about forms. I think forms are really important. Now, it might not fit your identity, so think about that. Maybe you're not a form kind of person. I, I wasn't really a form kind of person, but I have to say that forms really work for me. I have an intake form. I ask my clients to fill it out. It's pretty detailed. I also have forms on how to take the remedy. Basics. If they're taking it in water, are they succussing it? Are they just diluting? What potency? And I have blanks on these forms where you can fill in name, date, the remedy, the potency. And then I have different types of instructions that I can pull from in my computer that will talk about an LM potency and how to take that, or an acute remedy, and how often to take it and what signs to look for. And I use a sliding scale of how are you feeling? Are you feeling better or worse? Let's look at your top 10 symptoms. Give them a mark on a 1 to 10 scale. Right now they feel horrible, so they're an 8 or a 9. 
And then after you take the remedy, give it a few hours, then where are you? So I compile all of these instructions into one document that I give to my clients with the remedy. That's been very helpful for me. I've also put together emails so that I can email the, the, the instructions if I need to, and it has my contact information and my hours that I'm available. So the last thing is marketing and marketing materials in the office. And we're going to talk a lot about marketing, actually, during the next little bit that we're chatting. We have about, I don't know, half an hour, 40 minutes that we'll talk, and then I'll open it up to questions. So we'll talk more about specific marketing when you're starting your practice, but specific to the to the office, make sure that the office that you work in, whether it's your own office that you're renting and you're all by yourself, of course you can put your marketing materials out, but if you're practicing within an office with other people, chiropractors, maybe there are other homeopaths, maybe massage people, acupuncturists, I don't know, it might be any of those, but see if you can work together on marketing. Support each other. See if you can offer them some kind of referral fee if they say to their clients, you know, you should check out homeopathy and here's why. And then see if you can leave marketing materials around the office. Now we'll talk very specifically about how to advertise your office, how to market your practice. I'm just going to take a little sip of water. And then we'll continue. So on the web, there's a lot you can do on the web. You can write blogs. You can do a lot of video sharing. So for example, if you're writing a blog, you might go to WordPress or Blogger or Tumblr, and you might write articles on the common cold or on how to use homeopathy for poison ivy, or you might talk about something uh, less acute and more constitutional, you might talk about migraines. So blogging is a great way to get attention. And you can link your blog to social media. You can link it to Twitter, to Facebook, and the like. Another thing that you can do is you can look at creating some kind of video. Now, you know, with the, uh, the GoPro and iPhones and all of the phones now can do video, you can create a video that's pretty short and sweet. In this era of you know, Twitter and Tumblr, the era, era of 144 characters with Twitter, you want to make sure that anything you create that is visual is also short. And you can upload that to any of the places where you might normally see videos like YouTube, or you might put it on Vimeo, or on Daily Motion, etc. And when you do that, there are areas that you can put in tag words, and you can link to a URL for your website. So that's another way that you can drive traction in your marketing. Another way is to go to the yellow pages, they still exist, the yellow pages and super pages and Dex knows and all of these white pages uh, that are directories and listings. You can go to them and you can put in your listing. Some of them charge, some of them are free, but it's worth putting in at least one or two of them. Other things that you can do are go and create free ads. So I've listed out some of the different sites you can go to for free advertising. Some of them have some rules that you need to read and make sure that you're not breaking the rules. Um, when you're posting on one of these, you need to follow their structure and how they want you to present yourself and they may have limits on how often you can do it or exactly what you can say. Another thing you can do if you have some money that you can spend is you can go to the pay-per-click programs. That might be Google AdWords or Facebook has advertising or Bing and Yahoo also do advertising. So what's nice about that is all of this connects. All of this can link to your website. It can be blogged about. You can link through your blog. You can announce your blog, announce your ads, connect your ads through Twitter, through Pinterest, through Facebook. So the trick is here that more is better. So the more mentions, the more um, 
times you put your URLs for your blogs, the more you put your ads out there through social media, the more it is going to be picked up on. So more is better in this case. So I've put this picture up here with SEO in the center because we're going to talk about SEO, which is search engine optimization. But I put it up here for a very specific reason. So I want to just point out to you that I have put an attribution down here. I don't know if you can see my little red dot. I have put an attribution down here. And I'm going to show you how I got this and tell you why the attribution is on this page but not on this page. There is no attribution down at the bottom under this image. So bear with me as we go over and look at a couple of websites here. So I want to tell you about Wiki Commons. It's a free place for images. It's great. So you go into Wiki Commons, and I've already opened up some of the web pages so that we can talk about this a little bit more quickly. You go into Wiki Commons, and you can search for anything that you're looking for. In this case, I searched for SEO. And you can see that here's the image that I selected. And I liked that image. I thought it had a lot of um, color, a lot of movement to it. And you want something that pops out when you're, when you're talking to folks. And I liked that. So you might find an image, and then you select the URL. And it will tell you over on the right how to use this file. And you can see, I'll make this a little bigger, you can see that it says attribution right here. So they are saying you must use an attribution on this, right? On this one, when, you, when I searched search engine op optimization, I came up with this image on Wiki Commons, and I clicked the link. And I said, OK, I want to use this file. It says, here's the attribution, but attribution is not legally required. So that's just an important thing to notice. Uh, I've had run-ins with companies that sell their images, and like uh, Getty images. And even by copying an image on the web and putting it into your PowerPoint or even just in a development site for a website, they will track that. And even if it was not posted on your live website, it could be an issue. So be careful if it's a for sale image. Be careful in Wiki Commons if you want to use something and it, it wants you to use the attribution, make sure you do. So that was just a little note on that so that you don't uh, use an image that you shouldn't. So. Let's talk a little bit about um, images in general. So when you use creative images, maybe you put something that is your own creation or something that you've come up with with a friend or, or um, it could be anything. It could be an image of a cat. I mean, if you want to talk about how to use homeopathy for a cat, for example. And then you can embed tag words. You can embed items in those images. You can post them on your site, and sometimes folks will share them on Pinterest. Um, you can ask people on Facebook to go look at your image and then post it on Pinterest. You know, you can use your friends to help you market. And those drive more um, clicks and more uh, stickiness on your website. So use a lot of different images on your website, and also make sure that you change your images, not all the time, but enough so that you're getting some new traction on your website. So let's see, going through my notes here, we've talked about this, the advertisements. OK, so let's talk about SEO. So in order to get your website to rank high on the search engines, you need to make sure that you have keywords that work for you. So it might be flowers in New York. For you, it might be homeopath in Boston. You might want to make sure you have classical homeopath if that's how you're trained, which is how I'm trained. So classical homeopath in Boston. You might also put in words like healthcare, alternative, natural. Um, you know, you'll come up with lots of different keywords, but you want to make sure you use keywords in your search engine optimization. 
So it, SEO can happen naturally if you're doing a really good job of using social media and you're getting a lot of clicks and you're driving traffic to your website. That's the free way to do it. You can also pay a company that does SEO, and there are lots of them out there. And so you can just Google SEO. I did work with a couple of different SEO firms, and they were great. They were able to take my website and very quickly have it come to the top in Boulder, which was pretty cool. You can also read more about this if um, you go to that Google document that I've highlighted here. And on that web page, there is also a PDF called the Search Engine Optimization Starter Guide PDF, and that's a pretty good read on SEO. And then, of course, the other things that you can do is you can go into the top three search engines and you can place your website into those search engines, and these links will get you directly to that place where you put your website in. So that's a little bit about the web. Let's talk about other marketing. So in terms of other marketing, you know, let me show you my I'm going to show you my card and you can see my business card extends the marketing that I talked about. It has my image on it. I, I know you guys probably can't see the whole thing, but you can see it's got the leaves from my ginkgo tree, it's got my name and the colors that we picked, it's got my name, my title, it also has you know, what I'm offering and then it has my email as well. So it's probably a little blurry but I wanted to show you just that I'm extending my image across everything I do. It's also in my website, it's also on little flyers that I put out. So extend that brand that becomes your brand across everything you do. And that's your paper collateral. That's what we marketers call collateral. It's something that you leave behind, it's something that you hand out, it's something that represents you. Another great way to advertise that is natural is word of mouth. Ask your friends. Ask your Facebook friends. Ask your dentist's friends. Ask anyone you can to talk about homeopathy and help them talk about it. Help them understand in a very simplistic way what homeopathy is. And then come up with your elevator pitch and give it to them so that they can offer it to their friends. So a neighbor of mine has young children. I've helped her young children with teething, with sleepless nights, with monsters under the bed, um, all kinds of different little issues. And so she says to her friends, you have to see Christina because she's helped my kids with teething, sleepless nights, monsters under the bed. It's very simple. She doesn't really know how homeopathy works and she doesn't need to. But ask your friends and ask your clients to use word of mouth. Now, a bird dog with referrals means that you're giving a little something back to the person who is making a referral. It, I think it originated in car sales. Um, a bird dog is a fee that the car sales company or the, the dealership would give to somebody for referring a friend of theirs to the dealership and then if a car was bought they would send, I don't know, 50 bucks or something to the person referring. So you don't have to do it that way of course, you can do it by offering a discount in your practice. You can say, look, it seems that things are going well, would you agree? And if your client says, yes, I'm feeling much better, we've handled my migraine, I have much more energy, I'm thinking more clearly now that I'm sleeping better, thank you. At that point, you might say, would you be willing to tell your friends? And if they say, sure, say, well, you know, if that works for you and it's comfortable for you, then I'm happy to give you a discount the next time you come in for a follow-up. You know, maybe it's 10%, whatever it is comfortable for you, you come up with a discount that you can offer them for a referral. You can also offer a referral you know, discount uh, for their friend who comes in. So you can say, gosh, thank you so much for making a referral. Please tell your friend I'm happy to give them a discount for coming to see me off of the initial uh, intake time that I spend with them. I will reduce that fee by whatever is comfortable. So that's a bird dog. You can also 
do email newsletters, and that's something that you can do through Constant Contact or MailChimp, and there are other companies, I forget what they're called, Emma's List or something like that. There's some other email companies, and you can Google that and come up with some different companies through which you can do email marketing. And that is something that you can, you can also link to your website, Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, your blog, you can link it everywhere, and you should. And you should ask people in that email newsletter to share on those buttons through, through the buttons like Twitter and Facebook, and also to sign up for your newsletter. So initially, you will be creating that list, and you will be marketing to that list. But eventually, you can ask them to sign up, and you can ask them to ask other people to sign up. And in that newsletter, you can also repurpose a blog you've written, you can write new content, you can make it educational, or you can make it, you know, to some degree a marketing pitch. I think people generally appreciate free insight, though. So my take on email newsletters is educate. My take is to say, look, we're approaching fall. It's going to be cold and flu season. Let's talk about how you avoid colds and flus. Let's talk about what you can do if you start to get sick. Let's talk about what homeopathic remedies you can use if you are sick. The other thing you can do is local talks. These different organizations that I've listed really are eager for free talks. Their members like learning new things. You might think, oh, the Kiwanis would never want to hear about homeopathy, but I've talked to them. You might think that the chamber isn't interested in something that's not typical business, but I've done presentations there. So it's the kind of thing where you have to put yourself out a little bit, go to the networking events that the chamber has, um, ask people if they belong to any of these volunteer organizations like Lions or Kiwanis and see if they're looking for content. More often than not, even if it's something totally off the grid for them, it's not something they've ever heard about, often they are very interested in finding out more about it. Plus, you're filling a space for them. They need content and you're bringing that content to them. You can also go to health food stores or other health-oriented organizations. Um, I've talked in hospitals. I've talked in churches. I've talked in networking groups. I've talked to moms groups. So another great area is to look online for all the different moms groups, running groups, any activity that you're interested in that you can become a member of authentically, uh, really you're interested in it, then you can then start to say to people on those uh, clubs online, is there an opportunity for me to do a presentation? I'd love to share with you my passion about homeopathy. So it's something that you can, you can move forward in in terms of face-to-face -face or in terms of online talks. So then there's also the homeopathy school, and this is a great resource. It's one that I've used a lot of my... Um, friends who came out of the same programs that I took, they're using. Um, so during clinic, you get to meet um, other students. You also can potentially have referrals from the clinic. Um, they have the practitioner listening, listing. Once you are a uh, certified homeopath, you can go on that link, find a homeopath that I've circled here in green. And then they also do email newsletters, and they have Facebook and Twitter that they are marketing to. And they're also hungry for content. And you can write articles and send them to the school, ask them what they think. Is this a useful article? Would they like to publish it? If they publish it, can they link to your website? Can they send you any you know, referrals that might come through that? It's a way that you can use the school that you've spent so much time with and has helped you get the training that you need you can work with them, and they can help promote your practice as well. So at this point, I just want to kind of go back over really quickly some of the ideas that we've talked about, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. In fact, I'll even go look right now and see if we have any questions. No questions so far. Um, but what we've talked about today is we've talked about your identity, and that's really critical for starting a business, any business. 
who are you and what are you selling? And what, how do you want to be perceived? And I talked about I like to be perceived as real, um, the things I love. Um, I talked about success. And you need to look at those things to decide how you want to be perceived and how you define success. And then you want to put together branding or marketing materials that represent you. And you want to proliferate those branding and marketing, marketing materials across everything you can. And the more the better. In today's game with marketing, it's very different than it used to be back when I first started in marketing. It's no longer about cold calling and doing lead generation programs, which I did a lot of back in the day. It's now really about connecting, networking, talking to people, um, getting the word out. You can go to networking groups. There are these places like Business Networking International or the Chamber Networking Groups um, or groups called Links, which also help you network, where you get up and you do a pitch uh, every week for a couple of minutes and then once a month or so, someone will get up and give a longer pitch. And you get to talk with those people and they become your salespeople. So there are lots of different avenues and the more of these that you do, the better off you'll be. So I'm going to pause there and I'm going to look in the, in the question box here. And I encourage you to, to definitely give me a question if you have. Um, and I'll just pause for a second. So any questions that you might have, please type into your question box. Okay. All right, if I see no questions, then we'll probably end the webinar just a little bit uh, early. And I encourage you to uh, come back and visit this webinar and use some of the tools that are listed in here. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate that uh, you spent the time. And uh, I wish you all the best success and luck in your new practice. Be well.